Hey, 42 here. Imagine this. You walk into the nearest pharmacy because you're feeling a little bit under the weather, but instead of giving you a lozenger for your sore throat or a tube of ointment for your weird rash or some pills for your persistent headache, the chemist passes you a spade and suggests you dig up your recently deceased grandmother. That might not sound like the most obvious prescription under the circumstances, well, unless your local branch of Boots is run by Jeffrey Dahmer. But for hundreds of years, corpse medicine, the use of human body parts to cure various ailments, was a very common thing indeed. And the question on everyone's minds wasn't so much, should we eat people? But who should we eat? And which limb will benefit me the most? Even Leonardo da Vinci wasn't averse to a spot of corpse munching. We preserve our life with the death of others, he's quoted as saying. In a dead thing, insensate life remains, which, when it is reunited with the stomachs of the living, regains sensitive and intellectual life. And 16th century Swiss physician Paracelsus, otherwise known as the father of toxicology, certainly would have agreed with him, believing that in order to cure a condition, you had to treat it with something similar. For instance, if you had a toothache, you could simply touch a corpse's tooth to your own tooth and the pain would go away. Or if you had a headache, you could snack on a bit of ground up skull and you'd be right as rain in no time. I'm told skull is very Moorish. Over the next few centuries, many corpse medicine practitioners followed Paracelsus's lead, although sometimes the parts of the corpse used had no relation at all to the ailments they were supposed to cure. Queen Elizabeth I treated her smallpox scars by rubbing human fat over her face. Coffin water, that's literally water scooped out of a coffin, was used for warts, and cataracts were dealt with by blowing powdered human excrement into the eyes. English physician George Thompson was particularly confident in his cure for hemorrhoids, which involved liberal quantities of sweat from a dying man, or for particularly serious cases, to touch the piles with a severed hand. Apparently, this would clear up your bum grapes no problem, but I do recommend giving your corpse hand a good wash before using it for anything else. Luckily, treatments have progressed significantly since then, and you won't have to snack on a bit of corpse to prevent your hair loss these days with the super simple treatment offered by Keeps, who've kindly sponsored today's video. I have a good friend who started to struggle with hair loss in his 20s, and truthfully, it really got him down. And he's not alone. Did you know, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you still have hair left. In the past, you had to go to the doctor's office for a hair loss prescription. But now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit an online doctor and get the medication you need delivered directly to your door. I really like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months. So you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose hair just yet. But prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results. And the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. So, where did all this necro-lunacy come from in the first place? Well, in those days, spirit was thought to be the thing that linked body and soul. With body parts containing the spirit of the corpse they were taken from. It was also thought that blood carried the soul, and as such, fresh blood was considered to be particularly potent. But the culture of corpse medicine throughout Europe has its roots in ancient Rome, particularly the blood quaffing bits. Ancient Roman doctors thought that by drinking blood straight from a freshly croaked gladiator, it was possible to absorb the vitality of these young men who, up until a few seconds before they'd been horribly murdered, had been fit and strong. 
This was supposed to be particularly good for epilepsy, and sufferers would sometimes crowd a fallen gladiator in order to suck the living blood from his wounds. But if you find still warm blood sucked directly from the veins to be a little bit off-putting, I'm told some people can be a little bit squeamish about those things, then I have just a thing for you in a new section I'm going to call 42's Corpse Recipes, Meals to Die For. First up, Blood Jam. Perfect with a thick slice of toast and a mug of tea. <laughs> this recipe was kindly provided by a 17th century Franciscan apothecary. Thanks for writing into the channel. Step 1. Take blood from persons of warm, moist temperament, such as those of a blotchy red complexion and rather plump of build. Step 2. Let it dry into a sticky mass. Step 3. Place it upon a flat, smooth table of soft wood and cut it into thin little slices, allowing its watery part to drip away. When it is no longer dripping, place it on a stove on the same table and stir it to a batter with a knife. Step 4. When it is absolutely dry, place it immediately in a very warm bronze mortar and pound it, forcing it through a sieve of finest silk. When it has all been sieved, seal it in a glass jar. Renew it in the spring of every year. Sounds delightful, doesn't it? Let's see you top that one, Paul Hollywood. It was generally believed corpse medicine was most effective if the person in question had died violently. Paracelsus once wrote that after a man was executed, his vital spirits would burst forth from the circumference of the bone. But as most of the poor couldn't afford the prices of the top quality body bits sold in apothecaries, they had to improvise. In the late 19th century, crowds of epileptics would gather at scaffolds during executions, using cups to catch blood from recently decapitated corpses. In an account from the early 16th century, one particularly impatient member of the crowd rushed forward, snatched up a newly headless corpse, then started drinking blood directly from its severed neck as though chugging the world's most gruesome yard of ale. A similar thing happened when Charles I was beheaded for treason. Now, his blood was some serious grade A merchandise. Not only did it come from a person killed by violent means, but in those days, a monarch's touch was thought to cure the swollen lymph nodes caused by tuberculosis. It was a double whammy, a miracle cure-all if ever there was one. And as soon as Charles's head was parted from his shoulders, the crowd surged forward to bathe in his blood. Picture the club scene from the film Blade, only without the vampires and dance music. Apparently, the executioner even made a bit of extra cash on the side by selling blood-soaked sand and locks of the king's hair. Charles I's son, the unimaginatively named Charles II, might well have been tempted to join the blood-spattered crowd given half a chance, because he too was rather partial to a bit of corpse medicine, going so far as to require the recipe for distilled powdered skull from physician Jonathan Goddard. Possibly concerns that powdered skull sounded a little macabre, Charles wisely opted to give his new remedy a catchier name. The King's Drops. These drops were hugely popular throughout the 17th and 18th centuries and came to be seen as something of a panacea, apparently curing everything from nervousness to dysentery. It was even believed they could prevent death, if administered at the very moment of death itself. But there's just one small problem with that theory. When Charles II was dying, his doctors began frantically filling him with these drops, not to mention shoving several enemas up his royal backside. And guess what? He died. The popularity of the King's Drops was no coincidence, because according to the wisdom of corpse medicine, the human skull had some very desirable properties. Even the moss that grew on top of it, known as Osnia, was potent stuff with the power to cure the nosebleeds in powdered form. Lord High Chancellor of England, Sir Francis Bacon, claims that if you rubbed the blade of a weapon with Usnia, you could somehow heal any wounds it had caused. Personally, I think it would just be easier to not cause the wounds in the first place, but each to his own. The stuff inside our skulls was considered pretty useful too. 
In fact, physician and alchemist John French described a very tasty sounding brain tincture in 1651's The Art of Distillation. Which leads us to the next installment of everyone's favourite cadaver cookery show, 42's Corpse Recipes. Step 1. Take the brains of a young man that have died a violent death, together with the membranes, arteries, veins, nerves, and all the pith of the back. Step 2. Bruise these in a stone mortar till they become a kind of pap. Step 3. Once mashed, cover the brain paste in spirit of wine and leave it to digest in horse poo. Ah, delicious! One of the most popular ingredients of European corpse medicine was Egyptian mummy, which took the continent by storm. A whole host of different products appeared on the market in a short space of time. Treacle of mummy, balsam of mummy, and its most popular form, mummy powder, otherwise known as mummia. Mummia was available in apothecaries all across the continent and used for all manner of ailments. Stomach ulcers, broken bones, blood clots, poisoning, bites, joint pain. In fact, it was so popular that pharmaceutical giant Merck still lists it as a product in their archives, along with some genuine samples. The problem was, mummies were quite tricky to get hold of, especially if you lived a fair old way from Egypt. So, fraudulent mummies made from animals, criminals, or the poor soon became a thriving trade. Some physicians were even forced to create their own. One such process was recorded by German physician Johann Schroeder in his 17th century medical tomb, Pharmacopoeia Medico Chimica, which leads us nicely onto our third and final installment of 42's Corpse Recipes, courtesy of Dr. Schroeder himself. Step 1. Take the fresh, unspotted cadaver of a red-headed man, because in them the blood is thinner and the flesh more excellent. Make sure he's aged about 24 and has been executed or died a violent death. Step 2. Let the corpse lie one day and night in the sun and moon, but the weather must be good. Step 3. Cut the flesh in pieces and sprinkle it with myrrh and just a little aloe. Then soak it in spirits of wine for several days and hang it up for 6 or 10 hours. Step 4. Soak it again in spirits of wine, then let the pieces dry in dry air in a shady spot until they're similar to smoked meat and will not stink. Perhaps the most horrifying thing about medicinal cannibalism, however, is the hypocrisy. Well, okay, the whole eating dead human beings bit is probably the most horrifying bit, but then it's definitely the hypocrisy. Europeans of the time saw nothing wrong with munching on a bit of cadaver for their own health benefits, but they were quick to reinforce negative stereotypes of Native Americans by suggesting they practice cannibalism. Catholics were also criticised by Protestants for their belief in transubstantiation, the idea that the communion bread and wine literally turned into the blood and body of Christ in the mouths of the devout. But considering the popularity of corpse medicine, it's highly likely a fair number of Protestants were nibbling human offcuts of one sort or another to cure their ills, whilst judging their fellow Christians for doing the same thing to the Son of God in the hope of washing away their sins. But according to anthropologist Beth A. Conklin, who studied cannibalism extensively as one does, including spending time with the Wari, an Amazonian tribe who practiced cannibalism until the 60s, the whole practice of cannibalism is rather more nuanced than you might think. The Wari, for example, practice two different forms of cannibalism. One related to war, where devouring a recently dispatched enemy was seen as a way of expressing anger towards them, and one related to funerals, where eating the flesh of a recently departed loved one was a way to express grief and affection. To the Wari, Digging a big hole in the ground and lobbing the corpse of someone you love inside to slowly rot away is as disturbing an idea as cannibalism is to you and me. The idea that cannibalism wasn't always as barbaric as you might think is perhaps best represented by the Mellified Man, a legendary medicinal substance created by literally mummifying a person in honey. What makes the Mellified Man unique within corpse medicine is that the person would submit themselves to be mellified willingly for the benefit of their community. 
When they sensed the end was near, they would eat nothing but honey for a month. At which point, even their excretia would turn to pure honey. As you can imagine, when you've succeeded in turning yourself into a human bottle of squirty honey, death soon followed. The body would then be placed in a stone coffin full of honey, which, when dug up a few hundred years later, would have turned into hardened candy and would be used to treat wounds and fractures by taking a small amount internally. My, even Winnie the Pooh didn't eat so much honey that he started shitting it. As Europeans started getting slightly more civilized, using things like knives and forks, washing at least once a week and generally deciding that cadavers weren't the most hygienic things to have around the house, medicinal cannibalism eventually started to go out of fashion. And I'm sure we're all quite glad about that, right? It's easy for us to look back from our cosy vantage point here in the 21st century and label this practice as disgusting, even barbaric. And fair enough, if a friend invited you over to dinner and you found out their Auntie Brenda was on the menu, you'd probably run from the house screaming. But are we really above using parts of dead bodies to cure ourselves, even today? In fact, we aren't even all that picky about making sure the bodies are dead before we start borrowing bits of them. After all, if you've lost a lot of blood, you'll gladly accept a transfusion. And then there's organ transplants, of course, whether it's a heart from a very generous recently deceased donor, or a kidney from one of your living nearest and dearest. This idea doesn't tend to make us queasy at all. Organ trafficking has even become a problem in recent years due to high demand and short supply, and it's estimated that over 10,000 transplanted organs are bought every year, mostly harvested illegally from living people. Between 2001 and 2003, more than 100 kidney transplants were illegally carried out by St. Augustine Hospital in South Africa. In 2005, the kidneys of Chinese prisoners were sold to British patients. And in 2002, a huge operation was uncovered in India involving almost 2,000 illegal transplants from poor and migrant workers with a value of around $32 million. And although not quite corpse medicine, some of us modern types aren't above dipping a toe in the world of monumentally disgusting treatments like urine therapy, a practice backed by pseudoscience which was first popularized by British naturopath John Armstrong in the 20th century. After reading, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well in the Bible, Armstrong decided this was probably God's way of telling us to drink our own piss. And to this day, some people are known to indulge in a bit of piddle quaffing. Former Prime Minister of India, Moraji Desai, was a long-time advocate of urine therapy and even gave an in-depth interview on the subject on 60 Minutes. Actress Sarah Miles drank her own urine for three decades, believing it immunized her against various allergies. And boxer Juan Manuel Marquez was filmed drinking his own urine by HBO during a training session before his fight with Floyd Mayweather. He lost, by the way, so maybe urine doesn't have magical properties after all. Oh, and how could I possibly leave out survival expert Bear Grylls, who quite happily guzzles down his own urine like it's a particularly fine Chateauneuf de Pape. So yes, maybe we shouldn't be too judgmental of our ancestors. I mean, if you knew a loved one could be cured of a terrible illness or even saved from death by offering yourself up post-death as an all-you-can-eat buffet, you'd be more than happy to, wouldn't you? I know I would. Well, as long as I'm cooked respectfully, of course, and preferably by a gourmet chef. Eat me medium rare or not at all, that's my motto. And thanks for watching. Thanks again to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to try it out using the link below.